David Dodge shows us astronomy on the internet. RadarSat International had a successful launch of their new satellite, and we'll see it. And David Dodge has Astro News. All this and more on The Astronomy Show. Welcome to the November edition of the Astronomy Show. Since it was fixed, the Hubble Space Telescope has amazed both astronomers and the general public with its amazing views of the universe in which we live. UBC astronomers Harvey Richer and Greg Fallman were part of a team that was lucky enough to use the Hubble Space Telescope. Tonight, not only will, will they be sharing the results of their observations with us, but they'll be giving us some idea of what, how astronomers actually use the world's most powerful telescope. Tonight, I'm, uh, I'm at the H.R. McMillan Planetarium to cover the premiere of their brand new show, Hubble's Universe. With me, I've got Paul Deans, who's the program director of the planetarium. So, Paul, um, we're here to see your nice Hubble show. Would you like to see our nice Hubble show? I'd love to see your Hubble show. Look straight that way, Paul. <laughs> that uh, any thinking individual is concerned with is the age of the universe. I mean, how long has the universe been here? We thought we used to know the answer to that, but in the last few years, we've become a little bit less um, sure of what this answer is. There's been two good age determinations of the universe, and unfortunately, they do not agree. Uh, one of them, which is a project actually done with the Hubble Space Telescope itself, indicates that the age of the Earth is about 8 billion years. Another project, which Greg Fallman and I have been involved with over the last dozen years or so, is to age date the oldest objects in the universe that we can find, things called globular star clusters. These things turn out to be somewhere between 14 and 16 billion years old. So the two estimates disagree by almost a factor of two. It's quite ironic that the Hubble Space Telescope is going to be involved in both sets of measurements. We will see whether or not this conflict can be resolved through observations of the globular star cluster M4. We'll be looking for some of the very oldest stars in this star cluster, the white dwarfs. The white dwarfs will provide an age which is independent of the two other age determinations which I just mentioned. Um, a white dwarf is the end product of evolution of uh, a normal star like the sun. It's basically the burnt out core of a star like the sun. And we think we understand the physics of white dwarfs very well. They cool at a very predictable rate. So how cool a white dwarf is, is basically a clock. And we can try and read that clock, and that'll give us an age, an estimate of the age of uh, the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope is the ideal instrument for doing this particular problem, looking at the white dwarfs. These stars are extremely faint, and they are found mostly right in the centers of these globular star clusters, surrounded by lots and lots of other stars. The big advantage of the Hubble Space Telescope is its ability to resolve very tiny images. We can see details in these star clusters that we cannot possibly see from the ground. Welcome to a different part of the Astronomy Show uh, where we're going to talk about the Internet. We'll be doing this from time to time throughout the season, but uh, what we do is uh, concentrate on uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has a web page, and anybody who's familiar with the internet should know the basic protocols, uh, the HTT HTTP, uh, uh, Hypertext trans Transfer Protocols, to get to the various addresses around the world. Uh, I uh, start off with the uh, Pacific Space Center's homepage, it's something that I worked on myself, and I've linked on to uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So why don't we leap off here and uh, see what's happening out in space. Here we are at the uh, Hubble Space Telescope's uh, public pictures. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind about the Hubble Space Telescope is every uh, piece of data 
is owned by the researcher for one year. And only after one year passes will they release images. That is to say, the research will, researcher will release images. So while this may say uh, recent images, these are the only the images that have been released by the researcher. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope does do some uh, public relations work, and they put a couple of things on the page. And right now, uh, we have a choice of the latest releases, pictures organized by subject, if you want to do any research yourself, uh, the 1995 releases, the y all the releases in, in the current year, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope's greatest hits between 1990 and current, all the best images, and uh, the 1994 releases, all the things done last year. And they have a special area just for the comet Levy 9 and uh, Jupiter impact. And then they also have areas that deals with uh, what the uh, images were like before the mission uh, was repaired and shortly after the mission, mission was repaired. So what I thought we'd do is just cruise around the latest releases. That's the stuff that tends to be the hot stuff. And uh, this is what you'll see if you click onto that page. Yeah, there's their logo. And then you'll have a, a list of uh, images they've got here. The ones that are in blue, uh, at least in my, the way my machine is set up, I have not looked at yet. The ones that are in purple, we have looked at. So let's just go to uh, the gravitational shape lenses. A hot thing in astronomy these days is here we have a number of images of a galaxy that is bending the light of an object behind that galaxy. And uh, astronomers believe that they can learn more about uh, our universe by looking at these gravitational lenses, as we see here. Back to the planetarium and show you uh, that the RASC, Vancouver Center, has a, a page. We have, I maintain it here at the planetarium's homepage, which, by the way, if you're keeping notes, is http colon backslash backslash pacific hyphen space hyphen center, spelled the Canadian way, dot bca, sorry, dot bc dot ca. Once you get there, scroll down the menu and you'll come to Societies. You click that one, you'll get to the Vancouver Center of the Royal Astronomical Society, which gives a rundown of what's happening for the, uh, for the two months in question, October and November. And uh, thanks to the editors of NOVA, Ken Nelson et al., uh, they update their information to me and I pass it along to the world. We also can connect to other centers. We have uh, centers that are on the web, astronomy on the internet. We can talk to, com to observatories around the world. We can actually use telescopes around the world all by computer. So until next time, I'm David Dodge. Don't forget our internet address at pacificspacecenter.bc.ca. See you then. One of the nice things about working with the Hubble Space Telescope is that you don't have to go there and sit in the top of a cold mountain and freeze, or nor do you have to go off in space. But what you do is after your project is accepted, sometime later, about six months to a year later, they just send you a whole pile of tapes. And then we take these tapes, we run them through our uh, tape reader, we put them onto our own disks, and then we can look at these raw data frames. What I'm going to uh, look at here is um, one of the frames one of the raw frames, uh, one of the single frames which we obtained uh, of uh, a small field in the globular cluster M4. Uh, every white dot, large white dot that you can see here is an individual star in the globular cluster. But on top of that, you can see a large number of small little white dots over here. And these are not stars at all, but these are cosmic rays. Cosmic rays really mess up our picture quite badly. You can see not only are they just small dots that look like stars, but occasionally there are very long streaks. These have to be removed in order to measure the stars accurately. You can see uh, on the image here that uh, what we're doing is we're blinking two frames. One frame is a raw image, and another frame is an image that many images have been stacked together, and they've been what's called median filtered. And what that will do is remove the cosmic rays, but allow the stars to remain. And you can see that on the the median image, which is the image that doesn't have all the cosmic rays, um, it's much, much easier to find faint stars as compared to the single image where there's a large number of contaminating, large number of contaminating pixels uh, due to all the cosmic rays. If you take a look, if you follow the cursor here, you can see that all the white dots that are pointed here are individual stars, most of which are very much like our own sun in this cluster which is about 7,000 light years uh, away from the Earth. And I want to point out one very, very faint star here, which we'll look at in just a moment, 
Uh, perhaps you can't see it. Maybe I can't even see it myself. Um, there it is. It's just above the cursor. Uh, it's an extremely faint object. And in just a moment, I'll show you why we uh, discovered that this was, in fact, one of the white dwarf candidates, which we've been looking for. So what we actually do in terms of measurement is what we're interested in is how bright each one of these stars is. So effectively what we measure is the amount of energy in each one of these dots. And you can see, of course, that the, the stars which are brighter have more energy in them. The stars which are fainter has le have less energy in them. And that's basically th the simple measurement that we make. We actually measure the total amount of energy in each one of these stars, and that gives us a, an estimate of how much energy the star itself is putting out. Because uh, these stars are all members of a star cluster, all the stars are at the same distance away from us. This means that we can measure the relative energy output of the stars themselves by comparing the apparent brightness that we see on this image. This is one of the big advantages of observing with star clusters. Just to give you some idea about how faint the objects are that we're actually seeing here, a typical white dwarf in this, in this cluster is putting out the amount of energy that a 60-watt light bulb uh, would put out as seen from the distance of the moon. So the, the faintest objects that we're seeing here effectively are 60-watt light bulbs um, sitting on the surface of the moon. So these are incredibly faint objects that we would never have any chance of measuring from the, from the ground. But with the great power of the Hubble Space Telescope, we're capable of measuring uh, their brightness and detecting them and measuring their brightnesses. What I'm uh, bringing up here is um, a release image of um, the image of um, M4, which we obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. This isn't the official promotion picture, if you like, for the globular cluster M4. And what's shown here on the left panel is a ground-based image of the cluster. So each little white dot that you see here is an individual star in the cluster. And this cluster probably has close to 100,000 of these stars. And the very small box that you see over here has been expanded to the region shown on the right. And this is, in fact, the, the region on the right is, in fact, a Hubble Space Telescope image. The stars are, in fact, uh, shown in pretty much their true colors because we took the three colors that we had and to form a, a color image. So you're seeing the stars pretty much with uh, their real colors. So you can see fairly whitish cream-colored stars. And these would be stars of temperatures around six or 7,000, 6,000 degrees or so. And then you see quite red stars, which would have surface temperatures of perhaps something in the range of four or 5,000 degrees. And then circled, as you can see here, are a number of the white dwarfs which we found in these clusters. And these are very small objects, but they are very, very hot. And that's why they look bluish uh, in, this, in this picture. I think you can liken uh, a globular cluster to uh, perhaps a, a retirement community. These are very, very old stars. Every star that you see here, we believe, is of the order of about 15 billion years old. They all formed at the same time very soon after the, uh, the Big Bang itself. And these stars have, been remain have remained in this cluster for a period of about 15 billion years old. So they're incredibly old objects. And fact is, th these kinds of clusters, these globular clusters, of which there's about 150 to 200 in our galaxy, are the oldest objects in the universe for which we can get an accurate age. Um, what you see here is a composite diagram for all four of the chips combined. In early August, the 12 members of the team assembled here at UBC to discuss the project. This was the first time we actually had data to consider. The earlier team meetings, we were just talking about hypothetical things because we never had data to discuss. So we were able to talk about the first results, the very exciting first results that came down from uh, our analysis. We were able to talk about what exciting results we were getting, how should they be interpreted. We were able to talk about what kind of observations we should try for in the next round with the Hubble Space Telescope. Welcome to Astro News on the Astronomy Show. I'm David Dodge. And as usual, we'll start off with the phases of the moon. For this month, the uh, full moon will be on the 7th, the last quarter will be on the 15th, the new moon on the 22nd, and first quarter is on the 28th. This month's full moon is called the Frosty or Beaver Moon, probably coming from the time of year with the who cold temperatures and the activities that are going on in the woods. The planets Venus, Mars and Jupiter will be gathering in the western skies for a few days later this month. This is just a line of sight event. The planets are actually very, very far away from each other. Astrologers will likely try and make something of this event, but for those of us who like looking at the nighttime sky, this is something just to sit back, relax, and enjoy. But you have to be on your toes. It's happening shortly after sunset. 
You don't need very much. All you need is a nice, clear sky such as we have tonight and an unobstructed southwestern horizon. The order of events are, on the 16th, Mars and Jupiter will pass by each other, about the width of two moons. Mars will be the star-like object close to the horizon. Jupiter will be brighter and above it. Venus, the brightest star in the skies, will be a bit closer to the horizon and a bit farther away by about four moon widths. On the evening of the 17th, notice how much closer to Jupiter and Mars Venus has moved. From the 18th to the 19th, Venus passes Jupiter and sneaks up on Mars. On the 22nd, Venus and Mars will, to the unaided eye, seem to merge. Only optical aid, such as a pair of binoculars, will show the small gap of space between the two. And to cap it off, on the evening of the 24th, the moon passes by the trio. On the evening of the 18th, the Leonid meteor shower peaks. Astronomers are starting to pay more attention to this meteor shower as the end of the 90s approaches. Historical archives show that every 33 years, and the last time was in 1966, the Earth passes through the central portion of the Leonid meteor stream, rubble left over from the passage of a comet. And for a few hours, there are quite literally thousands of meteors streaking across the skies. It's over before you know it, and as there's always uncertainties about meteor showers and the comets that spawn them, astronomers, mostly amateur astronomers, are keeping a vigil in the sky every November. This will be a sight that no one would want to miss. Saturn is the bright star to the south or southeast these evenings. Well, it's not particularly bright, but through a telescope, it's always a crowd pleaser. On the evening of the 19th, its ring plane passes across the sun. What this means is that for the next few months, when we look at Saturn through a telescope, we will see the unilluminated underside of the rings. This happens only once every 15 years or so. There's always something happening in the heavens these days. On October the 21st, a bright meteor was spotted zooming across our skies. One report suggested that it landed near Pemberton and let out, started off a few forest fires. But observations from as far away as Kamloops and Tofino discounted this observation. Meteors always be, give the impression of being very close. Actually, when you see a meteor, you're looking at a spot some 60 to 100 kilometers above the Earth and some tens of kilometers downrange, so to speak. Ballistic trajectories and inertia will take the meteor even further away. So while you may think you saw the meteor hit the hill across the valley, nothing could be further from the truth. At any rate, continue looking at the skies, and don't forget to bring along your favorite measuring stick, your hand. Remember, a clenched fist that's held at arm's length subtends 10 degrees from here to here. So if you see a meteor crossing the sky, note where it was, count how many fist distances above the horizon it was, where along the horizon it went, count how high up, and then tally that stuff together and contact the planetarium or the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. We'll tally that information, and uh, maybe it'll, it certainly would be useful for us to try and find where the meteor landed. If a meteor landed, and it's called a meteorite, and it might be worth a lot of money. Well, that's it for Astro News. We'll see you next month, and keep on looking up. We've seen what the raw data look like, and now we've also seen what the processed data look like, what the frames look like after a certain amount of processing. But the main point, of course, is what are the scientific results that came out of this detailed analysis? We, we would have been very surprised if we had not found white dwarfs and globular clusters. After all, we think we understand how stars evolve, and the kind of stars that we look at in these globular clusters should have formed white dwarfs as end products. And indeed, we found white dwarfs and globular clusters as we expected. We thought that we would find of order of 100, and we actually found somewhat less than that, but it's certainly within the uncertainties in both the observations uh, and in the theory. Yes, the white dwarfs that we found lie along a sequence, and uh, this sequence is predicted and calculated by theory. The observations, uh, the results that we have obtained from the observations are in excellent agreement with the known theory. The data that we have obtained so far, however, do not go as deep as we would like. They are not yet deep enough, faint enough, to actually answer the fundamental questions that we are interested in. In the next round of the Hubble Space Telescope, 
we are going to be applying for an amount of time which is going to be large enough to try and get the very, very faintest white dwarfs, which will be able to tell us whether the universe is 8, 10, 12, or 16 billion years old. This is a very, very ambitious project. We're going to be asking for about 3% of all the time available with the Hubble Space Telescope in that particular cycle, which lasts about a year. So for about a week, uh, somewhere a week to 10 days, we're going to be exposing on one particular field in a globular cluster to try and get the extremely faint white dwarfs, which will actually tell us whether the universe is 8, 10, or perhaps even as old as 14 to 16 billion years old. The end result of the efforts with the observations and the data analysis is a paper which was published in September 1995 in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. I want to stress that at the end of all of this, we will be able to make a firm statement about the age of the universe. Surely this is one of the most intellectually rewarding statements that one can make. People have been worried about this, thinking about this, since man began to look at the stars. And hopefully, within the next few years, we may indeed be able to provide an answer to that question. I think because we wanted to do a show with a storyline, but we didn't want the storyline to be technology, we wanted it to be results. And uh, for Hubble's history, a lot of it, uh, it has been a technological story. Um, it was launched, it didn't work, uh, it worked but you had to do computer corrections, uh, they were going to send astronauts up, this is all technology stuff. And we wanted to talk about some of the results, some of the good results. So once the, uh, the repairs were done and the good imagery started to come back, then it's a case of waiting until you get uh, a number of different uh, stories or topics that you can uh, put together into a program that tells you something about what Hubble is finding rather than just about what it's doing. And I suppose that leads to my second question is, what can the planetarium do to tell the Hubble's story that a book, a magazine, or a TV show couldn't do? I think the main thing is to try and put it in perspective because we have the Dome of Stars, if you like, and one of the things we can do is while discussing some of the things that Hubble is doing, some of the places it's looking, we can actually link that to something people can go out into the night sky and have a look at, whether it's Orion's nebula or whether it's something that's even pretty remote, uh, but at least you know sort of vaguely where to look, whereas uh, if you're reading it off the pages of time, that's fine, they can certainly do a good in-depth thing but trying to, to bring it home to a point where you can relate to it. It was great. You like, really liked it? Yes, I really liked it. Anything in particular? I love all the images. I thought it was really beautiful, and I thought the sound was particularly good. I thought it was most helpful and informative for me. I'm a parent, and my youngster's working on studying the universe, so it coincided quite well with what we were thinking about. for this to happen. So it uh, may have been a short two or three minute watch, but boy, it was sure exciting. It was uh, 10 years in that two or three minutes. It was the most exciting thing I've ever been involved in. It, it, I, my, I'm just so emotional about it because it's so important to the people here in Vancouver, the people in British Columbia, and to Canada. You know, we today we put up the world's most powerful and most advanced remote sensing civilian satellite that the world has ever had, and it's all Canadian. And it's pretty hard not to get excited about that.
to radar sat. <laughs> Let it be. <laughs> The preceding program was produced through the facilities of Rogers Community 4, Vancouver. We want to hear from you and invite you to leave your comments and suggestions on our 24-hour response line message machine. Please call 731-5812.